This and all talks at the 2019 JavaScript for WordPress conference are brought to you in part by our sponsors Pantheon, a high-performance hosting platform with agile developer tools. Check them out at pantheon.io. We're still on the JavaScript for WordPress conference. If you're here joining us on your live, please say hi and tell us what country you're from. Uh, for this next track, we have David Lockey. Did I pronounce that correctly? It's not Lock, it's Lockey. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay. Yeah, he's going to be talking to us about the state of blockchain and WordPress. So David is a CEO and founder of Pragmatic, a WordPress agency. Hi, Anthony. Hi, Dave. I see you. So I'm going to be putting um, David on the spotlight now. So you hear from him, and then I'll be here watching and listening to you. So hi, I'm David Luffy, uh, as Barry said. I'm coming to you from Brighton in the UK today. I'm not really tall. I've just got one of those laptops where the lap, uh, where the webcam is like right down in the corner, so it makes me look super tall. But um, hopefully you'll be looking at me rather than the slides today. So I've been working with WordPress, I guess, for 11 or 12 years as a freelancer and then um, through Pragmatic. I love how WordPress can help people. Um, and as we've got bigger as a business, I love how it can help businesses. and We can create a better world together. Along that kind of tech journey, I discovered cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And I guess I kind of got hooked on it uh, as a sort of side passion to the WordPress um, stuff. So today I want to kind of run through all the stuff that I found in that space and talk about how I think it's going to change the web in general and, and WordPress particularly. OK, so before we talk about blockchain, let's think about where we are with the web generally. So um, this is this is what I think of as, as Web1. So it's a desktop computer. It's a CRT monitor. Uh, it probably had a CD-ROM drive. And if you wanted to know something, you'd Google it, you'd print out the answer, and then you'd go and take that answer with you, like driving directions or something like that. Right now, where we are is Web2, which basically means lots of people walking around looking at their phones uh, all day. But that's, that's the kind of uh, generation of the web we're in. It's smartphones, it's social media, it's user-generated content, it's apps like Uber and Airbnb. We're kind of, um, we're, we're right in the thick of web too. So what's next? Well, I think we're starting to see signs of that, um, even at the kind of the end of the web two era, we're starting to see much more in terms of bots. So if you think about a website as a kind of broadcast media, it's one website for everyone that looks at it, although obviously the best ones are sort of personalized, then bots are really much more like a one-to-one -one conversation. They know who you are, they know your history, and you can have a conversation with them, however, however kind of uh, remedial it is at times. And they can go and essentially retrieve content for you uh, from websites and from other digital sources. So it's a very different paradigm than uh, Web2, where we have to still look at a whole app and consume the whole page. Web3 is about, let's go and get that piece of content via a bot and bring it into our own context. I think as Web3 matures, we're going to start seeing some really exciting stuff. So here's um, a cool video. I'm going to play these videos, and I'm going to talk over them as well. So this is a super cool little uh, augmented reality video. And it's like this little Lego guy who guides you around um, Legoland, which is a super nice way to interact because it's your own personal journey. And you can interact sort of on a one-to-one -one basis with Lego Man, which, which I love the idea of. Um, now, the problem with AR is that nobody's really come out with that uh, killer AR hardware yet. So Google Glass was uh, kind of cool for Uber geeks. Uh, nobody wants to walk around looking at their phone to do AR. So I guess everyone's still waiting for that kind of killer, killer AR piece of hardware. But I feel like it's around the corner pretty quickly. Um, sorry, let's go past this one. 
your cool logo man but that's it and we're also going to see stuff like this so this is um a lady at a i, I could guess a tech conference and she's looking at a smart mirror that's really a, you know it's an ipad but it's acting as a, a mirror and she's being able to change her hair color on the fly uh which is super cool and we can imagine these smart mirrors are going to get much more sophisticated and we're going to end up with you know being able to try clothes on being able to accessorize being able to change uh, all sorts of things about us in the smart mirror but those two ideas the lego man running around and the smart mirror they're all about the web as part of our ambient world so instead of having to look at a screen instead of having to spend time in front of a desktop computer it's the web in our world and i really hope that web 3 looks a lot less like us all walking around looking at our phones a lot more like us coming back to reality being face to face but having that overlaid with this really cool information which we all love um oh so probably the most crazy manifestation of uh, that i've seen of this so if we kind of maybe look to the end of the web 3 era maybe this is what that looks like so this is a really cool video called hyper reality and uh you're essentially seeing somebody's augmented reality day so here they are they're playing a the game you can see they've got messages they've got all this stuff coming through and as the, as the video develops you'll see that actually it's um it's just a very highly augmented reality that this person has but this really speaks to the entourage of technologies which are coming with web3 so this augmented reality stuff is the most obvious but here this this guy he's a maybe he's a bot in the corner there maybe she's talking to a brand and that's the brand spokesperson and it's not really him having a conversation but it's like a it's a deep faked video you can see she's actually on a bus um so there's a whole bunch of tech that's caught up in here there's uh blockchain and cryptocurrency managing usage rights and microtransactions and instant reconciliation of what she's doing there's obviously AR, there's massive AI to power all this stuff. There's edge computing because whatever this person's wearing on their head, it's probably not like a supercomputer. So we need to push a lot of that compute out to the cloud. If we're gonna do that, we need 5G. So it's this whole kind of suite of technologies which are coming down the line, uh, even now, that lead to this sort of manifestation. Now, obviously not everyone wants a world that's like this, but um, I think it's a really insight, like an, a really insightful piece of, um, video and there's a link down here if, if you want to watch it later i'm not going to make you sit and watch all of it so given a bit of context you know i think we're kind of coming out of web 2 into web 3 just waiting on a few things to uh kind of click into place and blockchain and cryptocurrency being one of those foundational technologies for web 3 let's have a look at the ways in which um wordpress could uh, blockchain could start impacting WordPress and, and the web generally. So I'm going to talk today about protocols and standards. So protocols like file transfer protocols and um, W3 standards. I'm going to talk about uh, payments and business models, federalization, usage rights, um, identity, privacy, open source, and also the way that we think about the web as sort of a, a tech stack um, in its own right. So first off, protocols and standards. I think this is a super interesting way of thinking about what blockchain does. So we're probably all familiar with um, these different technologies, TCP IP, HTTP, SMTP, DNS, etc. These are all uh, web protocols, but there's never been a money protocol for the web. Um, and cryptocurrencies, blockchain, Bitcoin here, um, they, they can act as a money protocol for the web, as a value transfer protocol for the web. So um, that's one way to think about what blockchain and crypto can do, and I'll talk about why. So even from the early, earliest days of um, the web, there's always been an HTTP error code for payment required. Oh, sorry, the arrow should be pointing down here. 402, payment required for requests. Everyone's familiar with 404s. There's a whole range of error codes. If you're unlucky or you push some bad code to prod, you're gonna see a 50, 
X error code. Um, 4x is a client errors, 5x is a server errors. So there's always been this one here, payment required for request, but nobody ever sees it because there's no way to implement a payment um, protocol at the moment. So why not? Well, let's think about what um, what web standards and web protocols are. So everyone's familiar with like the different W3 standards that come out around JavaScript, CSS, HTML. Um, and that, that same governing body, the W3C, since 2015 has been working on a couple of web standards for payments, but they're based around kind of uh, discrete payments, by which I mean like a, a typical normal transaction. So here's a T-shirt, it costs $20, and it's an API for making that kind of payment from the browser, which is still pretty cool. But it's what it's not, I would argue, is sort of is playing to the strengths of the web. And let's talk about that. So because there's this uh, lack of a kind of built in business model as part of the web, there's no uh, native value transfer protocol, then we end up with this sort of web that we have now, which is that a lot of a lot of content creators end up getting uh, nothing for their work or very badly remunerated. A lot of the web is plagued by ads. There's a lot of data capture that's going on and people are kind of using uh, strategies to create business models around traffic because they can't actually monetize the traffic directly itself. Um, so let's think about the, the web and what a, a native uh, web payment protocol or um, standard might need to be. So anyone can put a web page online, so it need to be permissionless. It's very easy to retrieve information online. If you know the address or you can click a link, then you can, you can access that information. So it's a very low cognitive load. See a, you know, see a picture of a puppy, you click it and see more puppies. It's super easy. Uh, and it's also kind of continuous, right? The, the underlying protocols and standards that make up the web make it almost as easy, kind of man, bandwidth and time notwithstanding, to retrieve a massive uh, video file or a um, huge database as it is to make a single HTTP request and bring back like a, a single JSON object. So those are the things that I think a, a good web payments protocol would need if it was going to stand up to the rest of what the web does and is. Here's a lovely example. So Imjur, which is this sort of meme creation website, been going a long time, it's got so much content. You, you've definitely benefited, unless this is your first day on the web, you've definitely benefited from the uh, meme creation community that lives on Imjur and creates these like crazy memes every day. They kind of permeate the rest of the web. And Imjur has, it does have some ads, but um, it does what a lot of other big websites do, at least to start with, you know, it relies on VC or private equity money because it can't really monetize this kind of huge traffic that they get and this wealth of creative talent that is captured within the site. And uh, it's this, you know, this quote is, Kind of really meaningful uh, and you can swap out meme creators for almost anyone you know youtube stars or uh, reddit moderators or wikipedia editors they see creators online never get their fair share all their work is like rebuilt remixed reshared across the web um people take credit for other people's work the whole time and the social networks that benefit from all this traffic of people sharing memes and sharing stuff that content creators have done just drives their ad revenue and very, very little of that comes back down to creators. And so that's kind of a, a challenge, but it also means there's a huge opportunity. So um, the quote at the start of this section was from um, the founder of Coil, which is a really interesting platform that aims to pay back creators. And they've basically given uh, $20 million to Imjur to go and pay those content creators so that people will keep coming back, they'll keep uh, 
creating that great content for visitors to the site and pay for that content but in a new and uh, in a new and cool way. And this is kind of what it looks like, right? So if somebody's browsing a site, in this case, that says Imgur, then there's a, a web um, a web monetization standard that uh, Imgur has implemented on their page. And if you've got a, a wallet in your browser, like a coil add-on in this case, and as you look at that content, then behind the scenes, your browser is sending like micro transactions, you know, cents or fractions of a cent um, that increment over time. So if you spend like all day on Imgur, then you probably end up paying like, you know, some money for it. But if you just look at a meme, it's like, you know, it's it's fractions of uh, fractions of a dollar. But over time, and given enough people, that adds up to a meaningful income. So it's a really interesting way of thinking about um, how a payment protocol could be online. It's the whole idea of uh, microtransactions. And uh, Coil are using, proposing this um, this new web standard, so it would be an open standard that anyone can um, implement. It's through sort of using this uh, platform called, uh, sorry, a protocol called Interledger, and they've got this draft standard called Web Monetization. So it's basically a currency agnostic uh, microtransaction platform. So you could be doing USD, you could be doing Ripple, you could in the future, I think, be doing Bitcoin or Ethereum. It doesn't matter. It's just a way for people to implement payments uh, through microtransactions on their site. I think that's really interesting. And this is what it looks like. Uh, I had to get a bit of JavaScript into a JavaScript conference talk. So here's what the kind of draft web monetization tag looks like. It's a meta tag called monetization, and it defines defines the standard that's being used and then it allows people to put their own payment pointer in there so like their own payment address whatever that is and then if somebody visits the site that's got a web monetization enabled wallet there then that payment just initiates automatically and behind the scenes without people having to spend time thinking you know, is this content worth three dollars a month or 25.99 a year it just happens and it sends it so nobody cares about it and there are other uh, payment uh, gateways and, and interesting payment things happening with WordPress directly as well. So we built a plugin with Woo, uh, sorry with Coinbase Commerce for WooCommerce, which lets merchants sell uh, sorry accept cryptocurrencies in return for their goods and services. So uh, if you go to a Coinbase Commerce enabled store, you can buy a deeply cap uh, with Bitcoin, for example. Which is pretty cool. Um, is what this looks like. Um, so I'm not sure if this is like the full live version or this is um, something that they're just demoing that's in beta. And this just looks like people making a payment to a QR code, which is kind of what we expect these days. But the interesting thing here is that there was no central bank involved in that. There was no PayPal. There was no central ledger recording that transaction it just happened as part of the in this game as the, the bitcoin lightning network um sorry here we are okay um so i'm not going to get into what lightning network is but there are, there are other gateways out there now allowing these um micro transactions through lightning network uh directly into your WooCommerce um, store. It's super cool. So these are like here and there things you can download, integrate, and get going with them, people are using them. I think Coinbase Commerce said that they've had like a few million dollars or a few hundred million dollars spent through their Merchant Gateway since they opened it up, which is, which is really interesting. Uh, so what have we got here? Uh, here's another one. So this is a project called uh, Brave, which is coming at this whole problem from a different angle. So Brave is like a little ecosystem. Uh, it's, it's a browser. It's a privacy-first browser. Um, it blocks a bunch of tracking scripts. It also comes with a wallet built in. So you can see here the guys um, popping his wallet up with BAT, this idea of a basic attention token. Basic attention tokens are basically like micro 
transactions. And the principle is exactly the same. If you go to a bat-enabled website and you've got a bat wallet in your browser, then you can earn bat for, um, sorry, that website publisher can earn bat whilst you're looking at that page. And you can set kind of what your budget is and uh, all the rules around that. Interestingly, you can also earn that by watching ads. So rather than just getting force fed ads, um, you can have a much higher quality interaction with an advertiser because you're, you're, watching, you're choosing to watch that content. You're opting in. It's not being rammed down your throat. Uh, so yeah, really interesting. And it's actually a really great browser, especially if you're on mobile because it blocks so much stuff. It's super fast. So I definitely recommend to read about the project. It's by... A uh, guy who's uh, founded JavaScript and co-founded Mozilla, a guy called Brendan Ike. He's a serious individual, so it's um, definitely worth reading what these these folks are up to. Um, okay, so we've talked about the idea of a web monetization standard, a protocol. Um, we've looked at that as a kind of browser solution to that. Let's have a little look at Civil, and I'm just going to check the chat box and see if anyone's got any questions. No, can you all hear me okay? Is this all making sense? Am I going too fast, going too slow? I guess I'll carry on. So Civil is a, um, it's a, it's a web pub publishing platform that is here to promote independent journalism. So. Civil has a whole token ecosystem built into it. So you can buy civil tokens and you can use those to reward content creators, but you can also use those tokens to participate in the governance of the platform. So everything from we think this newsroom is you know, guilty of plagiarism or copyright theft, uh, do you agree that they should get kicked off the platform? And that's like an open governance system. People can vote, if you, anyone can vote if they've got civil tokens, right through to um, development roadmap. So which feature should we build next? So it's a, it's a really interesting way of building an economy into a community and into an ecosystem. Civil are also using um, the, the notarization properties of blockchain. Um, so once you publish content on Civil, it gets saved to, uh, I think it's, maybe it's EOS. There's a, it saves your content to a blockchain, basically, which makes it permanently available. So as, as long as you can access that, um, that block, you know where it is, then nobody can take it down because blockchains are immutable. I'm kind of assuming that you'll have a basic intro to blockchain here. If not, then some of this stuff's going to go over your head. Don't worry, there's loads of stuff online you can use to, to kind of research what I'm talking about. Um, and it even as far as a project by WordPress.com, so Newspack, if you haven't seen this, it's their um, it's kind of their WordPress stack for digital news sites. Um, and it includes a bunch of different integrations, but it also includes an integration with Sybil directly. So even automatic, you know, the, the company ran by one of the co-founders of WordPress is building blockchain tokenization, cryptocurrency into some of their products at this point. So if you want a kind of state of WordPress and blockchain, like here's a great example. It's happening. All right. So I talked about this in the context of civil, but let's have a little dive into notarization and also usage rights off the back of that. So this is our kind of all too common experience of payments online. When we're trying to access content online, this is what it looks like, you know, the registration wall, it's a paywall, login, register, etc. It's like, it's super clunky because I don't know if I want to pay 10 pounds a month or 30 pounds a month for the times, it's great content, but you know, I travel quite a lot. I don't have that much time to look at news. You know, I'd be really happy to pay them per read of an article, but asking me to subscribe on a regular basis is, is too much. It's not for me. There are plenty of people where that, that is fine. That's what they want to do. But with me, they're leaving money on the table. It's also really interesting thinking about like 
what a, what a website like the Times, like even just an individual news story, what that really means in terms of um, content creators. So the way that websites have to work at the moment is they pretty much get everyone to uh, sign contracts that give the Times permission to use that content, so it gives them usage rights, or they um, or they, in fact, just transfer ownership of that content, so, so it's theirs. And that's kind of sad. Um, it feels like a bit of a blunt instrument approach to do this. So let's have a, let's just run through, like who could all the potential rights holders be on this page? So the Sunday Times, of course, they've got the domain name, they've got the brand name, they've got the styling, they've got the traffic, got all the rest of the content, they've got the whole kind of catalog. Right up here, there's a fabric conditioner called Comfort, I don't know, if, uh, You'll have that where you live, but it's yeah, like typical. I think it's probably Unilever, um, you know, consumer ad banner. Somebody created that ad, uh, including the creative, including the branding. Was that an agency? Was that comfort in house? Who took that background photo? Uh, this photo of the policeman here. That's from a, a photo library called Alamy, but almost certainly the photo, the photographer wasn't directly employed by Alamy, they've just got a, a contract and they've signed over their usage rights to Alamy as part of a stock library so that uh, the time can use it. The article itself could have been written by one person, almost certainly would have had uh, editorial oversight. Maybe it was a few people, maybe it was collaborative, I don't know. Um, and even below that, then we've got kind of the photos and excerpts of related articles. So it's that one, two, three, four, five, uh, you know, minimum six different rights holders on this page, potential rights holders on this page. So how could how could we make that more elegant, more in line with the web? Well, what if we didn't have to have this kind of overarching contract up front, but each piece of content came embedded with its own usage rights? So when you upload a, a photo to Gutenberg, then that photo, that block, inherits all of the, the copyright, the um, the usage rights, the monetization wallet, all of that stuff was part of that block. So if you can reuse that through some exchanges or portals and you remix that into their own content. So you think about a, a different newspaper's website where they haven't agreed upfront contracts for usage rights, but they've embedded the usage rights with the content that they're putting there. And as people pay to digest that content, that kind of uh, curated blend of content, on this one page, then that that monetization flows back down that kind of uh, rights holders um, pyramid. So even the original photographer gets paid based on the actual amount of views that that photo gets, uh, kind of worldwide, wherever it's used. So, uh, and for me, that's a far more exciting way to monetize the web than slap ads over it. There's far more just for content creators as well, where they uh, don't have to sign away their usage rights up front, never knowing whether the image that they've captured is going to be on the front page of every newspaper or it's never going to be seen. So, um, so yeah, you know, here's, here's a typical Gutenberg workflow. What if in the right hand side, you also had, you know, here's the is the rights holder for this work, and here's the monetization wallet, and of course that could be embedded from uh, from the photo or from the video as you upload it. But they're all just different properties of the block. So here they're very much visual ones: alignment, height, width, etc. I think we're going to see Gutenberg being far more sophisticated in terms of presenting content out to uh, automated agents, so bots and AI going forward. So uh, if you imagine like a a product listing, a product shot might also have embedded information about stock levels or uh, availability, restrictions, variants, uh, all that stuff. Maybe it's even got enough, uh, maybe even links to like a 4D rendering, uh, 3D rendering that can be integrated into a smart mirror bot by, um, by a super still smart mirror. But I do think that um, Gutenberg is a super exciting way to think about content. So not as page builders, but as as content management, 
in its purest form. Each block is its own unique piece of content. Okay, so notarization. If anyone was at WordCamp Europe this year, you'd have seen maybe a talk by um, Michael Baz. Uh, he and his company have created WordProof, which is a super cool idea. I wish I'd thought of it. It's very simple uh, in its concept. Basically, whenever you publish a post on your WordPress site, then it saves a copy of that post to the blockchain. Um, and as I said previously, once it's on a blockchain, it means that you can't be tampered with. You can't say, you can't change the date that it was posted there. You can't change what was in it. And so if anyone ever challenges your ownership of that content, the authenticity, you can go right back to that earliest time uh, and say, look, well, here's, here's when I published it. And the proof is it's on the blockchain. It can't be tampered with. So this must be true. People used to do this with uh, copyright, sending themselves uh, copies of manuscripts in the post and not opening the envelope. This is like the 21st century version of that. And definitely check out WordProof if you, if you haven't yet. Uh, here's an example of what um, a notarized piece of content looks like. So this is actually on a service called Dragon Chain Eternal, which is part of Disney, I think, or Disney invested in them. Uh, and this is a tweet that has been uh, immortalized forevermore on that blockchain. So as long as you uh, have the address for it, it'll always be there as long as Dragon Chain is, is there. Cool. Uh, WordPress specific again, here's a, here's a plugin. So Power, it's really interesting. It does notarization. It also does decentralized content discovery um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. It looks like the plugin hasn't been updated for a little while, but as far as I know, the project's still active. So maybe they just uh, maybe they just haven't got around to checking it. But uh, it's it's worth checking this one out as well. But um, they're they're going for more of a kind of ecosystem play. But again, you can embed this in web in your WordPress site just using this plugin um, and start start acting in that community. So let's jump out to the future a little bit. Say we're living in that kind of AR future, walking along, you've got your AR device on, you're live streaming your, you know, Beyonce is live streaming her day and she comes across this busker, Billy Charlotte Campbell, uh, who is singing a song, maybe she's singing a, a cover of a Doors song, I don't know. But in this context, who, who are the rights holders that are involved? And how does that play out? So if Beyonce suddenly gives Charlotte Campbell, you know, 10 million views and it leads to her getting a record signing, uh, what about the people who own the rights to the song, to the lyrics who wrote them originally? How about the band who made that song famous? What about Charlotte? You know, what does she get out of that? If Beyonce is getting paid how many trillions uh, to live stream her day, Surely Charlotte deserves a bit of that. So how do we how do we manage for usage rights in this kind of real time content consumption creation world? And I think embedding those usage rights in the content as it's created and getting paid automatically for that based on who's viewing the content and how it's being viewed, basically having those sort of uh, contracts pre-negotiated is a really interesting idea. Um, and it's kind of here now as well. So this isn't WordPress, obviously, this is YouTube, but I think the principle still holds. If you prepare your content for an automated agent to consume, then you're probably going to do better. So YouTube here, obviously, it can prepare its own content because it's a platform, but it's AI um, is responsible for 70% of all YouTube views. And because YouTube is 37% of all internet traffic on mobile, it means that the YouTube AI is responsible for 25% or more of all internet traffic on mobile. I find that absolutely astounding. But also really informative. I think more and more these automated agents are going to go and, you know, these recommendation algorithms are going to, keep us fed with content so that we don't actually have to go out there and source it. And that idea of having Gutenberg blocks include everything from 
colour through to payment and usage rights embedded within them, it's a natural fit for bots to come and retrieve this information and, and serve it to you. All right, so let's have a talk about identity and privacy and security now. These are our topics, and it's probably the thing that's most broken with the web at the moment, all this uh, personal data that's getting hoovered up by everyone, it seems. Um, let's think about the impact of blockchain. First, let's think about the problem. So Amy Webb's a futurist. Um, I love her talks and the, the research that her institute puts out. I didn't realize I was a walking data mine generating five or 600 data points all the time. That's crazy. I don't even know five or 600 data points about myself. But folks like Google and Facebook, it seems do. So in some ways that can be really helpful and in other ways it's super scary. Um, and this is, this is kind of how things are at the moment, right? Let's pick on Facebook because why not? Um, so over, over on the left, there's you, everything you do, your social, you know, all of your communities or your friends or the things you like. Almost every website or app you visit also has uh, Facebook tracking uh, scripts on there. So Facebook can see what you're doing even if you're not on uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram. And then, of course, Facebook use that data through their ad platform to serve ads back to those websites and apps so that you buy stuff and advertisers are happy. And that's the paradigm that we live in. But Facebook is obviously under fire. And I would say at the moment, they've got three pretty serious risks as a, as a business. So, um, and I'm talking about Facebook because when, when you think about data, identity, privacy, security, you know, Facebook's always in that conversation because they, have, they know so much about so many of us. So the first risk is this data control. So they store all this data about you. That's kind of risky for them. You know, it makes them a massive honeypot for cyber uh, security. And I don't even want to think about how much money they spend on um, cyber security. I, I hope a real lot. Um, but it's also a risk from a legislation and regulation point of view, you know, GDPR and like even from a kind of brand perception point of view, the fact that I think Facebook are collecting all this data about me it kind of creeps people out. Risk two is a really interesting one. It's around uh, content moderation. So um, there's, there's a, a real existential risk to Facebook that the government's going to decide that they are actually publishers and that they are liable for stuff that gets published on their platform. And they're kind of fighting this running battle. Same with Twitter, you know, the Nazis on Twitter, same as um, same as a bunch of stuff, you know, that the New Zealand um, attacker video that tried to get uploaded like millions of times. The Facebook have got this real problem with content moderation. It's super expensive. It's a very wicked problem to try and solve. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then risk three is just that it's such a monolith now, you know, they've got a marketplace, they've got Instagram, they've got all these different chat apps, Facebook itself, all this data, the ad platform, and regulators and legislators are starting to get a little bit twitchy about that. So let's, let's talk about what they're trying to do with it, I think what they're trying to do with it with Libra, which is their, uh, which is a new project that they've been leading uh, with this consortium. So these are like the founding members of the Libra Association. The Libra is like a, it's got some really nice aims to be like a universal currency and to be a blockchain that's shared by all these sort of tech giants, investment giants, and the third sector giants that connects people through a universal economy, making payments as easy as likes or shares. It's a really interesting project, but I think it solves some, some of those risks for Facebook as well. So Libra itself is an association um, headquartered in Switzerland and governed by these, uh, these people. So Libra is not Facebook. Facebook are just lead, leading it. And uh, I don't know if you can see right down at the bottom, there's a a logo that says Calibra, which is Facebook's wallet for Libra, this cryptocurrency. 
Anyway, let's have a look, a little think about how this could play out. So back to these risks at Facebook cards. So what I think they're going to do is to stick all of their data that they hold about you into the Libra blockchain. Um, because blockchains can hold data as well as just being a ledger for financial transactions. You can store almost something in the blockchain. Um, so I think what they're planning to do is to push a lot of that personal data into the Libra blockchain. And you would then own that data um, directly and personally. But there should really be an arrow that goes from you right to that data. Now, why would Facebook dispose of all that data like that? Well, firstly, it means that they're giving the responsibility for that um, data back to you, but they can then offer on top of that uh, custodian services so they can help you look after the private keys that access your personal data because most people aren't sophisticated enough to want to know about private keys. You know, a lot of people even struggle with passwords. So Facebook can be your kind of your security guard helping you to guard your data. And you'll notice how that's a very different proposition from we're, still, we're storing all this data about you. It's more, we're offering a service to help you protect your data. But of course, because it's on the Libra blockchain, Facebook, uh, you know, founding members of it, they're going to be able to um, access not only that data with your permission, which you'll hand over in return for them, helping you safeguard that information, but they're they're also going to be able to get a whole bunch of new information, new data. So as well as, you know, who you talk to, on which channels, which web pages and apps you go to, when, all that scary stuff, they're also now going to get access to all this financial transaction data as well. So that solves a couple of risks. One, it means that all that data, instead of being centralized, is now decentralized. Each, um, you know, each Libra account, if you think of it that way, has its own private key. So a, a hacker would have to do do a lot more work to get access. It's not like they could just access one database and dump like hundreds of millions of records. They would have to get access to each individual identity locker separately. That changes the paradigm for cybersecurity. It also massively changes what Facebook are, are perceived as, and like takes that risk out of Facebook in a lot of ways. And it means that regulators and legislators are going to be kind of fighting a rearguard battle because they're going to be trying to argue that Facebook is this monolith and it's got too much power, but actually they're just going to say, well, we don't hold any data about anyone. We just provide all these services. So super smart play. So what about content moderation? Well, They've done this with WhatsApp already, and they've said they're going to roll it out to Messenger and Instagram. They're just going to end-to-end -end encrypt it all. So I think what, what you're going to see is that there's only uh, public Facebook, and maybe even that will be end-to-end -end encrypted, and you'll be able to share those encryption keys with people that you choose to. And Facebook will basically say, we can't moderate any of this content because we can't see it, because our users want privacy, so we've end-to-end -end encrypted everything. So it's a, it's a really, I think it's a super elegant piece of corporate strategy. Um, and it speaks to a lot of what, uh, what they can then do. Yeah, they can basically evade the, you know, all this pressure that's on them. You know, in best case, they come out with something that really is privacy first and really is a universal currency and really does um, change people's perception of them. But let's think about it in a more practical way. So here's an Instagram pair of shoes. Why should buying them be any different from liking them or leaving a comment or sharing them? With Libra, it will be that easy because you're logged into Facebook. You put your Libra wallet attached. You know where you, you know, it's got your default delivery stuff. It's like one click buy on Amazon, but embedded right within your social media. So you can see how this is going to start generating revenue for them because you're no longer clicking away from Instagram to Shopify to buy. You're completing that transaction right within Instagram with one click, just the same as liking it. Uh, similarly, Facebook Marketplace, um, it's already starting to eat into eBay's um, interests. Imagine if they've got uh, built-in wallets, that's, that's only going to continue. 
And one one thing that sort of occurs to me is that you know Google's been giving WordPress a lot of support, and I, I'm definitely appreciative for their attention. The open web is in Google's direct interest. You know, if the web turns into Facebook, it's a walled garden, and Google can't do what it needs to do, and it can't make money like it needs to make money. But at the moment, Facebook can't really integrate with the open web. With Libre, it can, because all those things that we talked about, web monetization standards, embedding wallets in your browser and in web pages. If they do that with Libra, then suddenly their sticky mitts are all over the open web as well. And I think that's going to involve paying people to look at Facebook ads as well. You'll be able to earn Libra as well as spend it on the Facebook platform or on any website that's got Libra integrated to it. So despite all of Google's investments, I'm a bit worried that they're a little bit behind the times here. And as soon as people realize they can make money, but not only that, their users will make money by looking at their content. I think we're going to see a paradigm shift. Anyway, I had to include this meme, of course. So yeah, Libra, I reckon they've, they've pulled a pretty good piece of strategy here and, uh, and done a bunch of stuff. Anyway, I've talked about that enough. But it's not without its troubles. Congress is rightly pretty scared about what Libra is doing, um, and they've asked them to stop doing any work on it. So uh, maybe people will need to be fully decentralized, like Bitcoin, to avoid that kind of regulation. Um, I'm going to speed through some stuff as, um, as predicted. I'm slightly overrunning. Um, sorry, uh, let me just check the chat box. Cool, cool, cool. Um, right, so open source, obviously super interesting to us. Some real tragic stories around WordPress. So um, the guy that ran Vanguard basically just had like a, he was looking at the worst things online, you know, all day, every day, just to like validate that he wasn't getting false positives on the spam stuff, this guy, uh, Jose Conti. Like a totally unrewarded, um, massive contribution that he gave to open source to WordPress. The great piece here about the broken economics of open source software and the fact that it takes, it's pretty much a full-time job being a maintainer on a popular open source software project. Uh, anyone can open a comment or a ticket or uh, criticize at any, any time, you know, there's no, you don't get paid for being a maintainer. GitHub have recognized this and they've introduced um, GitHub sponsors. So you can now sponsor a developer who's working on open source software. And that's like, that's a nice thing to do. But it still feels like it's a pretty clunky way of doing things, right? You've got to know about GitHub sponsors. You've got to think about the developer you want. You've got to go there and decide how much money to give them. And then like, just like a very web one -y way of doing things. Tide lifts another play on this. So uh, you can, uh, pay for a subscription, that means that your open source stack is looked after by creators and maintainers. So all these are efforts to try and fix some of that broken uh, economics behind open source. There's even obviously a Gitcoin. You can incentivize people to interact with your, with your Git projects and receive uh, payment. There's a really nice uh, piece in this white paper by Outlier Ventures that talks about community tokens. So if you're participating in an open source community, um, how can that be tied together with economics so that the people who have earned the right to vote can vote, etc. So it's a really worth a read that paper. Governance. I'm going to finish with this because I'm out of time, not because I'm trying to send any kind of message. A lot of benevolent dictators for life are thinking about sustainability of governance and projects. So here's a look at Drupal. Obviously there's a WordPress governance project. So even if the you know project leads aren't thinking about it, the communities are. And there's some really interesting uh, bits of thinking going on about this. So how do we how do we apply open source software development to the governance of those open source projects and communities? You know, how do we do governance without foundations essentially? Should we? Big like whenever I'm thinking about this stuff, I think 
some of their conversations in track in WordPress are like they get super heated, but and rightly so because there's a third of the web at stake. But with Bitcoin Core, there's like literally billions of dollars at stake. You know, if we do the wrong thing, then that could like, there's so much more pressure on product roadmaps and pull requests and code commits and what's the right way to go around it. So Decred is another cryptocurrency and they've really embraced that. So they've built this whole governance into cryptocurrency itself. So it's an autonomous organization. So they've built software to run the project that develops the software. Super interesting. Anyway, I think that's probably me out of time. I've got a bunch more slides. Have got any questions? I'll keep saying Mary will shout out if you see any questions. But we might as well use those three minutes if that's all right. Yes. Cool. So that idea of uh, autonomous organizations and the open source as a way of running uh, projects and businesses, there are a couple of nice examples out there. So bounties is around um, basically incentivizing the gig economy to come and work on your project and to earn um, to earn as a result of that, but like through shared interest and common purpose rather than just a straight kind of people per hour or five year kind of transaction. This is, uh, sorry, I've chopped the slide off, but it's the Open Collective, which is a new type of association where you can see contributed what and everything, like it's built to be transparent from the ground up. These are essentially organizations as software um, and then I'll finish up with these bits. So when we're looking at what a Web3 infrastructure needs to look like, it needs to look like what we have. So this is from Multicoin Capital. This is from Clover. So you can see there's a bunch of stuff in here, like UI, UX, um, DNS, etc. that is common to our like the web of today, but there's a whole bunch of other different uh, systems in there as well. Okay, great. That's that's awesome. I, All right. Thank yeah. You. I enjoyed the presentation, Dave. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, if uh, you have questions for him, you can reach out to him on the Slack workspace, the JS or WP Slack workspace, or tweet at him or send him a DM. All right. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Yeah, bye.